Okay, so thank you. So as our hosts have said, uh, the event today is about breaking the rules and imagining things differently, doing things in a new way. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by breaking at least one of the rules of the event because I want to start with an idea that, in fact, is quite old. It's an idea that, in some ways, has become the common sense of our age. And that's the notion that, as human beings, that all of us are equally worthy of recognition. Uh, all of us have equal significance. It's, this is the idea that's expressed, for example, in the American Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. It's the idea that's expressed in the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, 1789. Men are born free and remain equal in rights. And it's the idea that's expressed in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Now, these are not just, um, just empty phrases. I mean, this is the idea that's expressed in, uh, in you know, the characteristic of, uh, of all democracies nowadays, which is that every citizen has an equal right to vote. So not just those who've got money, uh, not just the men, not just those with the right skin color or the right religion, but all, all citizens are equally entitled to one vote. Uh, it's the idea that's expressed in the notion that there should be no discrimination on the basis of race, religion, sexuality, um, or gender. It's, uh, it's what's expressed, of course, in the idea of human rights, uh, in the idea that we have rights uh, not because of our nationality, not because of where we're born, but simply by virtue of being human. Now, it's an idea that was quite a long time coming, <laughs> Uh, I say, I, th I do think it's kind of now the defining idea of our age, but it was a long time coming. Those declarations I showed you, they start about 250 years ago. Um, and I'm sure that uh, many of you noticed that the first two declarations didn't, in fact, talk about human beings. They talked about men. Um, and indeed, they meant men. Um, it, if, you, if you kind of look at the kind of dates at which women actually got the equal right to vote with men uh, th through generally the course of the last century. It's pretty stunning how late some of those dates were. So sex was an exclusion. Uh, race was also an exclusion. So anyone who was a colonial subject, of course, was excluded from this idea of equality. But also even among those who were citizens. So if you think of the United States, it wasn't until the 1965 Voting Rights Act that all African Americans were able, were guaranteed the right to cast their vote in equality. Or you think of 1994, South Africa, uh, the first time when all South Africans, regardless of the color of their skin, were able to, uh, to vote in a general election. So it's, it's an idea that's been a long time coming. And, you know, and even, I mean, if you think more generally beyond something as fundamental as the right to vote, um, it's not something that we live up to very much. So whether you think of the, uh, of the, the various class snobberies through which people express their disdain for those they consider their inferiors, or you think of the highly racialized valuation of lives uh, in the uh, police shootings in the United States, the shootings that have inspired the Black Lives Matter campaign, or just the almost universal tendency, which I'm sure we all share, to rate the deaths of your fellow citizens, whether in war or plane crash or natural disaster, as of greater significance than what may be many multiples of those elsewhere in the world. In all of these ways, we don't really live up to this idea of our human equality. It, I think it's the defining idea of our age, but we don't really live up to it. Now, I've just got my 18 minutes for my TED talk, so um, I can't go into all of the, the reasons that I think explain that. I just want to kind of talk about one small part of the puzzle. And that's the idea that, in some way, we, we go down the wrong road. We kind of, uh, when we look for explanations, justifications, reasons for this human equality, 
and look to some kind of substance, some kind of human nature, some kind of quality that we're all supposed to share that is presented as the reason for this. Now, that may sound quite innocuous. The problem with it is that it makes the equality conditional. And once you make the equality conditional, you start having gradations of some people seeming more human than others, and you start having exclusions. So I want, at this point, just to show you this, uh, uh, this rather beautiful painting, which is from the Courtauld Gallery, uh, Lucas Cranach, the, uh, the elder, his painting of Adam and Eve the, uh, in the Bible, the first two human beings. Now, it's, um, in, some ways it's, uh, in some ways, it's very much a kind of picture of human equality, right? The Adam and Eve figures, the first man, the first woman, um, they're, they're, they're pretty much the same height. Uh, they're not wearing clothes, so there's no room for all those gender differentiations of dress where the men are always dressed in a very active way and the women are purely decorative. Uh, you know, Eve isn't kind of cradling a baby in her arms while Adam stands there proudly with his kind of stave defending the honor of his family. It's, you know, as far as the first two humans are concerned, it's, it's a picture of human equality. But if you think of it as a representation of humanity, right, these, these are white Europeans, right? The vast majority of people in the world today do not look anything like this. Uh, indeed, speaking as a white European, most white Europeans don't look anything like this, sadly. <laughs> Um, so, the kind of the, the, if this is the kind of the test of our humanity, right, if, if this is the test we have to pass in order to qualify as equals, it's a test, it's a test the vast majority of us are going to fail. And that, that's the problem, I think, that in many of the ways that we think about what it is to be human, we, in giving a reason for it, in producing a kind of justification for it in terms of some substance we're supposed to share, we make it conditional. And I want, um, I mean, I want to talk about, just give sort of three um, examples of the kinds of things that I'm thinking about, the kinds of ways in which we tend to make the equality conditional. One way we make it conditional um, is precisely by saying, picking on a particular characteristic that we say is the human characteristic that is said to be the reason why we should treat other people as our equals. A very common one, in fact, you saw it already in that United Nations declaration, a very common one is rationality, right? So people say, uh, of course uh, we're all different in terms of our wealth, of course we're all different in terms of our strengths, we may even be different in terms of our intelligence, but we're, all men are born with the capacity for reason, therefore all men are born equal. But actually, rationality, as indeed the way I said it indicates, rationality has historically been an incredibly gendered notion. Rationality has been attached to men. So that kind of men have been thought of as reason, women have been thought of as feelings and emotions. So when people said 250 years ago, uh, because of our shared capacity for reason, we must all be equal, they meant men, right? They didn't think that this could possibly apply to women. So that, that was an example where the kind of the, the no, what, we were, what justified our equality was some substance that turned out to be not a substance that was thought of as attaching to all human beings. That's one way in which the equality gets made conditional. There's a second way it, makes, it gets made conditional, and that's through um, a kind of a conception of the human which is a kind of very idealized, kind of uh, elevated conception of the human. Um, the good human, right? Not, you know, it's not just being a human that justifies your equality, it's being a good human. So you might think, for example, um, of the various states in America where people who have been convicted, uh, as, uh, convicted of a crime and have spent time in prison are barred for the rest of their lives from voting in elections. So that very fundamental equality is taken away from them because they've been bad humans, right? Um, or to think of an example from Europe, one might think of the, um, the refugee crisis, the kind of the uh, large number of Syrian and Iraqi refugees uh, escaping war zones, embarking on that terrifying trip to what they hope will be the relative safety of Europe. Now, 
Many people have expressed incredibly strong support for those refugees. And typically, when they've done that, it's been on the basis of some sense of a common humanity. That is, people have been able to look at the refugees and say, these people are not just refugees, they are human beings like ourselves. They are parents, they're children, they have brothers, they have sisters, they have hopes, they have fears. So that that notion of a common humanity, I think, was very much part of the support that so many people have given to, uh, to those refugees. But it also turned out, for many people, it turned out to be quite fragile. And I'm sure some of you recollect the, uh, the newspaper reports of the events in Cologne on New Year's Eve, when numerous uh, German women who were out celebrating the night uh, were robbed and, in some cases, sexually assaulted by people described as men, described as of uh, Arab and North African appearance some of whom subsequently turned out to be refugees. Now, for, for some people, that just completely turned the tide. It was as though the kind of the support for these refugees, human beings like ourselves, <laughs> dissolved completely when it turned out that some of those refugees weren't perfect refugees, right? So you didn't just have to be human to qualify for your equality. You had to be a really good human, right? You had to be a kind of, you had to be a, a, an exemplar of all the kind of the best qualities of human beings rather than being, like most of us, a, a mixture of good and bad. So that's the second way in which the equality sometimes gets made conditional. It gets made conditional uh, on, on having the best human qualities. And if you, don't if you don't exhibit the best human qualities, then you no longer qualify for that equal consideration. And then there's a third way which is rather different, um, which is making the equality conditional on not, no, not stressing, not thinking about, ignoring, overlooking the various differences between us. This, this is different because this is very often one which is, it's, it's done with the best intentions. Uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, uh, you hear when people say things like, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white. It doesn't matter whether you're lesbian, straight or gay. What matters is that we're all human beings, right? Or it's the kind of thing that people might, might be intending when they say, Christian, Muslim, or Jew, it makes no difference to me. What matters is that we're all human beings. Or a third one that you don't hear so much nowadays, but people used to say quite a lot when I was growing up. People might say, we're all the same under the skin. Now, if you think about that, I think particularly that third one, um, we're all the same under the skin, it's clearly, it's a thoroughly well-intentioned expression of equality and solidarity. But if you think about it, it does suggest that there is something problematic about your skin color. I have to kind of think of you as without that skin color. I have to imagine the real you under the skin. Or maybe I even have to imagine you as having a skin color like myself in order really to think of you as equal. Or the idea of uh, saying uh, Christian, Muslim, or Jew, it makes no difference to me. Well, if you're saying that to someone who is deeply religious, to whom it really does matter, then saying, you know, what matters is that we're human beings is, doesn't really come over as a real expression of people's equal significance and equal worth. Uh, and indeed, you know, the, I think, very common notion, um, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white, it doesn't matter whether you're lesbian, straight or gay. For people who are on the wrong side of the prejudice and the discrimination, of course, it does matter, and simply saying that it doesn't matter doesn't really kind of uh, add up to enough. There's, there's a kind of illustration of this that um, comes from the, uh, the political theorist, Hannah Arendt, who um, had to uh, flee from Germany in the early 1930s, eventually made her way to the United States, where she lived till her death in 1975. And she, was, uh, she returned to Germany in 1959, first time since having to leave it, you know, a quarter of a century earlier, to receive a, a, a big literary prize. And she used her uh, speech at the uh, prize ceremony to reflect critically on the notion of the human and humanity and really how little 
those had managed to achieve in those years. And this is what she said. She said, in the case of a friendship between a German and a Jew under the conditions of the Third Reich, it would, scarce, it would scarcely have been a sign of humanness if the friends had said, are we not both human beings? A law that prohibited the intercourse of Jews and Germans could be evaded but could not be defied by people who denied the reality of the distinction. In keeping with a humanness that had not lost the solid ground of reality, a humanness in the midst of the reality of persecution, they would have had to say to each other, a German and a Jew and friends. That is, in that context, in the context where Jewishness had this life or death significance, to simply overlook it, deny it, say what really matters is, a, is the common humanity underneath, it doesn't really stand up as a way of addressing what the problem is. So what I'm saying there, I mean, I'm not in any way saying that we don't need the idea, the idea of our common humanity. I mean, I think the idea of our common humanity is enormously important, and the idea that as human beings we are all to be regarded as equal, I clearly think is extremely important. But we shouldn't think of this as conditional. It's not conditional on demonstrating that we all have some, the same substance which makes us all fully human. It shouldn't be conditional on demonstrating that we're good humans, not bad humans. And it shouldn't be conditional on looking beyond, underneath, all of the differences that actually characterize us as human beings. We need to think of this idea of human equality as a commitment and a claim. It's a commitment we make to one another to regard one another as equals. It's a claim we make on one another to be regarded as an equal. I mean, as such, it seems to me it's one of the most amazing ideas that human beings have so far come up with, um, and, you know, very much one of the best. Thank you.